Welcome to another edition of Anglican Voices, where we get to sit down and talk to people, not necessarily Anglican, around the communion, but we have an, uh, an Anglican from the Anglican Continuum, Chandler Jones, and you guys are going to have a, a, a synod, a joint synod with uh, uh, many Continuum members in a week or two, and I thought it's a great time to sit down and talk with you about the Continuum, because a lot of people have a lot of questions. How are you doing today, Chandler? Excellent, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on with you. Well, thank you so much. Now, I'm going way back here. I think it was 1994, 1995. I was still an Episcopalian back then, um, but I was talking to a, a priest or bishop, and I said, have you heard of this Anglican t Continuum thing? And he goes, oh, Kevin, you don't want to get involved with those guys. They're just they're angry people. And I just I logged that in my mind. I put it way back here somewhere in the, on the left-hand lobe here. And I said, okay, I won't get really involved with the Continuum because of that. Um, is there truth to this um, that, uh, as I kind of read your history a little bit, um, people kind of think you guys are just the angry part of the Anglicanism? That is an interesting question, and it's one a lot of people raise. I think that there had been, years ago, a level of frustration, a level of anger, perhaps, about the changes that took place in the Anglican Communion in the 1960s and 70s. And I will say that whatever that feeling might have been 40 years ago, that has certainly changed uh, generationally as we've moved into the future. And now we're looking more at the unity of traditional Anglicanism and how we can cooperate and work together. Uh, in the early days of the continuing church, there was the feeling that there was a great need to preserve the tradition, particularly the traditional Book of Common Prayer, the classical form of Anglican worship and spirituality, uh, the doctrinal truths of the creed and the ancient Christian tradition. And I think there was a feeling at that time of some frustration because of the need that was felt to come out of the Episcopal Church in the United States, an experience that more recently was experienced in the Anglican Church in North America, the movement that led to the creation of the ACNA. And so it is, I think, that there was some strong feeling on the part of people who organized the continuing church, and it's unfortunate that there was the perception of anger at other Christians. If there were any feelings of anger, they were about the, the feeling of being hurt, of having the church abandon the tradition which had been received. So many times when I first became a continuing Anglican, I heard the phrase, we didn't leave the church, the church left sure. us. Yep. And I think that that's sort of the feeling that was manifested and perhaps interpreted as being anger directed at other people. I would characterize it more as a natural frustration, but that was beginning 40 years ago. And today the continuing church is a thriving, energetic, Christ-centered, missional church movement that seeks to proclaim the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Catholic and apostolic tradition the uh, emphasis is on the positive, and as we've seen with the course of decades, as more and more newer and younger people have come into the continuing church, the old hard feelings have certainly dissipated. The focus is not on the past, the focus is on the present and on the future mission of the church. Well, let's talk a little bit then about how the continuum formed, at least uh, in, in the 70s. Um, people remember back then, longtime Episcopalians, that there was a time in before 1976 when there was not women's ordination. And one of the primary uh, issues uh, that uh, some 2,000 people uh, had uh, was women's ordination. They, they gathered together in St. Louis and formed a continuum, but that relationship kind of broke apart. It did. The early history of the continuing church is complex, but I'd love to try to unfold it for you a little well, bit today. That's, today. What you're, that's what you're here for, is to, um, to, to, to help us understand the continuum. How does this all begin? Well, really, we have to go back to the 1960s, before the crisis regarding the ordination of women in the Episcopal Church. In the late 1960s, there was a great deal of upheaval in the wider society, in the wider culture, and the Episcopal Church of that time experienced its own upheaval, particularly in the figure of Bishop James Pike of California. And there were others, but he was representative of a radical 
movement, a secularizing movement, which rejected fundamental Christian doctrine, such as the dogma of the Holy Trinity, the truth of our Lord's resurrection from the dead, the deity of Jesus Christ, and Bishop Pike was never censured by the Episcopal Church for openly teaching heresy. And there were lay people in the church and in the wider Anglican communion at the time who were deeply alarmed by this failure to discipline a bishop who was teaching false doctrine. So in 1968, a group was organized called the American Episcopal Church. And that was the genesis of our jurisdiction, which today is known as the Anglican Province of America. But our Diocese of the Eastern United States was organized in 1968. And it was in reaction to the failure of the church to discipline a bishop who was consecrated and ordained to teach and to guard, to defend the faith, the failure to have him disciplined for rejecting creedal orthodoxy led to the organization of traditional Anglicans that early. Now, later, as we get into the 1970s, the crisis becomes more acute. And in 1973 and in 1976, you have the debates and the controversies over the ordination of women, first to the diaconate and then to the holy priesthood. And it is true that at the General Convention of 1976, we find a, a sort of watershed moment in what would lead to the organization of the wider continuing church. When the vote took place in 1976 to admit women to the priesthood, traditional Anglicans in significant numbers said they could not accept this innovation this theological novelty, and they decided to come out of the Episcopal Church and to reconstitute Orthodox Anglicanism in North America. In 1977, there was the Congress of St. Louis, and that was held in September of 1977, and it was not a church organizing body. The Congress of St. Louis was a voluntary gathering association of like-minded Anglicans who came together to pray, to read the Word of God, to meditate on Holy Scripture, to have fellowship, and to focus on what needed to be done in the future to ensure the preservation of Orthodox Anglicanism. The result of the Congress of St. Louis was a document called the Affirmation of St. Louis. It's not a creed, it's not a dogmatic statement, but it is a statement which reflects the concerns and the emphases of traditional Anglican, Anglicanism, traditional Anglicans at that time, and later the affirmation of St. Louis will become a document that binds traditional Anglicans of the continuing church together as a clear summary, a perspicuous statement of what traditional Anglicans believe. Now in 1978, there was a constitutional uh, movement to create the continuing church in the wider sense, in 1978, there was the consecration of four bishops, and that took place in Denver, Colorado, in January 1978. Those four bishops were James Moat, Dale Doran, Robert Sherwood Morse, and Peter Watterson. And these four bishops were consecrated for what was then called at that time, interestingly, the Anglican Church in North America. Wait now, a minute, you guys did it first? Well, that thing was originally the continuum, yes, it was. And there was a constitutional convention called in 1979 to bring these various dioceses that in the meantime had been organized into one jurisdiction. But that's where we run into some difficulty. There was difficulty, there was struggle, conflict in coming to an agreement on how the church should be constitutionally organized and the result of this, finally, was the separation of different groups into separate continuing churches. That really began in 1979. Well, that's what I've run into with my travels. You know, I'll sit down at a table and, oh, I'm a bishop so-and-so um, from so-and-so, so-and-so. So oh, you're Anglican Continuum. And he, they'll nod their head, but they'll say, yeah, but we don't, you know, we don't play well together, you know, with the other Continuum. Like, what does that mean? And apparently there's uh, strain and stress, you know, at different relationships within the continuum. Yes, that's exactly right. And our history for the last 40 years has been one where we have very much struggled to find common ground and to unite. But we have been divided as a movement, as a continuing church, 
moving into the future, and the principal differences have not been theological. There have been some differences regarding administration and canon law, but all of the Anglican churches of the continuum share a common liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer of 1928, the American Prayer Book. We share a common life in our worship expressed in the prayer book. We share a common creed. We share a common ordinal and the maintenance of the apostolic ministry of bishops, priests, and deacons, male in character, for all three orders. So the, the real differences have been primarily personal and have come about through disagreements, tragic disagreements, which uh, are connected perhaps to the way the church was governed, but also conflict of personality. Now, after 40 years in Atlanta, in just a week and a half, the beginning of the restoration of unity, which we had in the beginning back in 1977, 1978, that begins here in Atlanta at the 2017 Anglican Joint Synods, where the four principal continuing churches have chosen to come together, to walk together, and to begin to reunite the continuing church. It is a complex and a confusing story to people that are outside of the history of the continuum. The good news is that our reunion has begun. And the good point of all of that is that the church is being brought together by the Holy Spirit and we're seeing a renewed emphasis on our mission, our evangelism, our common work, our common theological formation of clergy and lay people alike. And we're looking to the future of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us back into that kind of unity for which our Lord prayed in St. John chapter 17. So we're turning the page, we're starting a new chapter in the continuing church, and we're moving forward. Now, one of the things in my travels, uh, especially with the formation of the ACNA, is what is Anglican? Who is Anglican? Who gets to pick out who is Anglican? Oh, well, everybody says, well, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury. If he says you're Anglican, you're Anglican. Um, in that question, is uh, the continuum Anglican? Are you recognized by Canterbury? It's a wonderful question. We have to go back into history to ask the question, who is an Anglican? For example, during the interregnum of Oliver, Oliver Cromwell mm -hmm. in the 17th century, uh, there was no Archbishop of Canterbury. He had been martyred. William Laud had been put to death in 1645. And there was a period of about 12 years where there was no see of Canterbury filled. There was a, a sort of sede vacante, an empty chair of the see of St. Augustine in Canterbury. Were there Anglicans? Were there Anglicans during that time period? We would say there were. Also, we can look to the non-jurors beginning in 1688 and the so-called Glorious Revolution that took place in England when the monarchy was displaced with uh, new monarchs from the continent, from Holland, and there were men who said they could not follow this new monarchy because they had sworn allegiance to the Stuart line and to King James II. And so they believed that their vow was before God and they could not renounce their oath of allegiance to the proper King of England, and they formed a, a movement called the non-jurors. They were non-swearers. They would not swear fealty or obedience to William and Mary. Were they Anglicans? I think the judgment of history would say that both the, the, the people that held on to the Anglican tradition during the interregnum and the people that held on to it in the non-juring movement were in fact Anglican. So the way that we understand the definition of Anglican is that we're Anglicans because we come from the Church of England, we have a direct continuity with the Anglican Communion, we have Anglican orders, Anglican sacraments, we have the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, our ethos, our culture, our history is entirely Anglican. We look to the course of Anglican history and theology for our teaching and practice, and so we would say that makes us Anglican. Uh, we would go farther and say that being identified with the See of Canterbury as a necessity to be an Anglican has some historical precedent, precedent but is not really necessary. Uh, the See of Canterbury ordains women bishops and women priests, and we would say that's a violation of Catholic intent and Catholic practice for 2,000 years, and communion with Canterbury is therefore not necessary. It reminds me of what uh, 
the one of the great priests at the Congress of St. Louis said in 1977, there was Father um, Carol Simcox, who was the editor of the Living Church for a great number of years, and he said, it is more important for us to be in communion with Christ than it is to be in communion with Canterbury. And that's our default position. Yeah, that's, that's a good position to have. Uh, lately, it's been kind of weird what uh, Canterbury does and does not to consider Anglican. Um, let's move on and talk about relationships now beyond uh, October Synod. Are you hoping now to form relationships uh, with other Anglican entities uh, and kind of grow this unity? Yes, absolutely. We could describe the process in which we are engaged at, as a three-tiered or three-step process, the way that we look at things ecumenically. The first goal of the Anglican Joint Synods of 2017 is to create a basis by which the disparate continuing churches, the separated continuing churches, can be reunited in one faith, in one doctrinal and religious life, in one expression of worship, in one Anglican tradition. So we have the four continuing churches coming together to form one sacramental communion, one fellowship, and that will happen in just about two weeks. The Anglican Catholic Church, the Diocese of the Holy Cross, the Anglican Province of America, and the Anglican Church in America. And we hope that th these four will become the basis then for attracting other continuing churches who share with us a common faith, a common theology, and a common history and practice. We'd like to bring them into a shared and full communion of one life together. Now beyond that, when we can get our own house in order, then what we hope to do is engage ecumenically with other Anglican churches that may not share our common theological or historical basis, but they are churches with whom, with which we would hope to have a meaningful and fruitful dialogue. And beyond that, God willing, someday, we'd like to engage in a wider ecumenical conversation with the other historic churches of Catholic Christendom. It would be a supreme blessing if we could finally have a rich and involved and engaged dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox churches, with the Orthodox Old Catholics, such as the Polish National Catholic Church, and of course the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of the Latin West. And we would look forward to doing that. But our priority right now has to be in getting our own house in order and putting things aright for the continuing church. For 40 years, we've had too much division, and that division has hampered and weakened the mission and the evangelistic effect that we have prayed and hoped for within our tradition. It is only by bringing the continuing churches together that we hope to fulfill our Lord's great commission and start to move faithfully and obediently into mission, into evangelism, into teaching and preaching the fullness of the Catholic faith. Once we can get the continuing churches on one page, in one place together, collaboratively working together as effectively one communion, then we can start to talk to other Anglicans about what we have in common. And I hope that we can do that. Well, I'm going to guess your age here, but you probably grew up in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, like myself, when the church was all about division. You know, you belonged in one denomination, you were not allowed to talk to another denomination. This is growing up in, in Wisconsin and the Midwest. You know, all denominations were at war. Uh, the last eight, ten years, I've seen more and more willingness to talk and willingness to put behind uh, us the disputes of the past. Um, and it, it's an interesting time to be a Christian when people are, you know, the little itty bitty things we used to fight about aren't as important anymore. That's very true, and thank God for it. Mm -hmm. Really, the divide of Christians today, as Bishop, oh, it was the Bishop of London, Graham Leonard, some years ago, sure. that the great division now between Christians is not denominational or sectarian. The division is about those who believe in divine revelation that the Christian faith is a given revelation from God and possesses the authentic mark of the Holy Ghost, that it is in fact God speaking to man and revealing himself and his saving will to us as recorded in Holy Scripture, as lived in the tradition of the church, 
It is Christians who believe that divine revelation is truly authentic and divine and divinely inspired on one side, and on the other side, Christians who believe that the Christian doctrine and tradition found in scripture and tradition is a construct, a man-made construct which is susceptible to reinterpretation based on cultural norms. Mm -hmm. I think that that is indeed today in our postmodern society and to a great extent of post-Christian society, it is this great divide now and it, it unites Christians and divides them. It unites all those Christians who believe in the authority of God's word written and in the authority of the apostolic tradition. And that's something that cuts across lines of groups or jurisdictions or denominations. Christians who actually believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he is the incarnate Son of God who came into the world to redeem us and to save us, that Jesus Christ is Lord, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that truth binds Christians across lots of different lines. And unfortunately, on the other side, we have Christians who today would say that all of this is basically of the zeitgeist. It's of the spirit of the age, and it must be accommodated to whatever contemporary culture has to say to us. Now, that may unite people on the other side in terms of how they see the basis of revelation or Christian belief, but it's a far cry from Orthodox Christianity. And I think that, yes, we are seeing now, in this day and age, a coming together because Christians have to be faithful to Christ and to one another if they discern the truth of this and if they're faithful to Christian teaching and Tradition. So I, I think that's absolutely right. I'm 46 years old. I grew up in the 70s and 80s and went to college in the early 90s and seminary, graduated from seminary in 1996. I've seen a lot of change along these decades as we've seen Christians start to grow together in the nature of what they truly believe. Faithful biblical Christians have far more in common with each other than that with which they disagree. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I've never done a count, but how many continuum churches are there in America? Depends who you ask. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's, I, before I interview, I sat down and I said, I need to learn as much about continuum in an hour as I possibly can. And I, I look, I'm looking for the number, and there's just no number out there. Uh, what's your best guesstimate? My, my best estimate is that there are seven continuing churches in the United States that can rightly claim that they have a direct continuity with the Anglican Communion and the Episcopal Church. Seven jurisdictions that maintain the ethos of traditional classical Anglicanism, that use the 1928 American Prayer Book, that have the, a structure based on historic Anglican canon law, and have Anglican orders that come directly from Canterbury through the Anglican Communion. My best guess is that there are seven jur jurisdictions of that kind. And in Canada, you do have a jurisdiction or two there as well. So in North America, I'd safely say there are nine or ten, depending on how you count them. We have the four coming together at the Anglican Joint Synods here in Atlanta, Georgia, October the 2nd through the 6th of this year. And those four represent the majority of continuing Anglicans in America. And how many continuing Anglicans are there? Worldwide? Probably no, did, in, the, in North America. North America. Well, worldwide, there are probably about 250,000. Okay. Um, so a quarter of a million people, that's, that's a pretty good uh, number. It's substantial worldwide because we have continuing churches now in virtually every Anglican communion province that has in one way or another altered the Catholic order of the church by women's ordination. Okay. We have continuing Anglicans in Canada, the United States, Puerto Rico, in the region of the Caribbean, in Central America. There are some in South America. There are continuing churches in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and throughout Africa. We have continuing churches in South Africa, in Zambia, and other countries. We now have continuing churches, and had have them for a long time, in places like Australia, and New Zealand and other countries. So when we take a look at the whole world, these are traditional continuing churches that maintain traditional liturgy 
in the historic prayer book, and they maintain the male apostolic ministry in all three grades or all three orders. And so they're continuing churches now throughout the world. In the United States, we've had them since 1968, and more prominently since 1978, and uh, they've continued to grow. Uh, one of the remarkable things about the continuing church is that in spite of itself, and even its own divisions, it has grown. And particularly in the last decade, we've seen very healthy and substantial growth. Currently, the appeal of the continuing church in a lot of our parishes is amongst millennials and younger people. That's what we're seeing here in Atlanta, because they often come from conservative evangelical backgrounds, or mega churches, or maybe independent Christian movements, but they come to traditional Anglicanism because they love the traditional liturgy. They love the beauty of holiness expressed in the reverence and the dignity, the sense of the numinous and the transcendent that is expressed in our form of worship. And so we see on the local level, on the grassroots level, we're starting to see growth amongst young people. And it's because of who we are and what we do at the altar and how we worship God in the tradition that we have received. So the continuing church should be reckoned with. It is, in fact, worldwide, quite a significant movement. Uh, I yeah, I gotta say, if you guys got your act together, you would be, you know, uh, that just by numbers, uh, you would certainly have a, a sizable position and uh, and a large voice uh, with it within the uh, the Anglican Communion. Um, our time has run out because my dog, who's in the basement, is starting to yap, and uh, he's the timer for all things Anglican voices. Chandler, I do want to thank you for your time, and I hope to join you uh, the first week of October, and we're going to live stream uh, your meeting, your joint synod, and uh, we ask that everybody who watches the show keep you in your prayers. Thank you again for your time, Chandler. Thank you, and God bless you, Kevin. It's been a joy to be with you today. Thank you so much.